Okie dokes. So we will continue there uh, about who, do people have written lease renewals SOPs. Um, but just to focus now on today's workshop, as I'm going to call it a workshop because the whole idea of a masterclass is that it's a bit more interactive, um, more in-depth, but people have more opportunity to ask questions. So guys, as we go through this masterclass, yes, I do talk to myself on a screen and it's a bit weird. Um, please, if you have any questions as we go through, feel free to pop them in the, um, in, the in the chat. I cannot see the chat or you when I'm busy doing the presentation because I have the presentation on both of my screens. Um, but I will stop every now and again and I will go into the chat and see if we have uh, what questions we have and <coughs> beg your pardon if there's any way I can assist you. So what are we going to cover? We're going to cover, well, the SOP that I've developed, but um, mainly we'll be focusing firstly on the best practice guidelines. Then we'll be looking at the Consumer Protection Act Section 14, which is a key for the vast majority of renewals. So it's important that we understand everything and the prescripts that are given to us in that particular section of the CPA. Um, we're then going to talk about the FICA requirements, and this in particular has to do with the amended FICA, FICA amended as they call it, which came into play on the 1st of April, or became effective, sorry, not into play, uh, effective on the 1st of April, um, I think it was 2019 now. Wow, time does fly. And um, we'll then talk about landlord and tenant communication um, and the timeframes and the deadlines. Just what I suggest and what I've learned works well in practice. Um, documenting the renewal, uh, once again, the Consumer Protection Act Section 14 comes in here and a best practice renewal procedure, which will really be filtered right the way through. So we'll be touching on that and looking at the documentation that I have developed over the years. Um, as per usual, when I do do presentations, I go back to my documentation and um, generally end up creating a new version. So I have over the last few days um, created the version two. Um, the last version I released publicly was last year. Um, so I have updated it and there's, uh, there's always current information. We'll be talking about specifically things like the current market, um, the importance of doing a credit check as one goes through um, the process or as part of the process and that sort of thing. Um, and, and a lot of those things have been developed or added given our experience of the last 12 months. Can you believe it? It is almost a year since we have been in lockdown um, and we've never been out. So um, a question, interestingly enough, last Thursday, I was honored to be asked to present a, um, a, 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 a presentation, a silly word, um, me presenting a presentation, but anyhow, um, at the real estate magazine, um, the ultimate rental or property management masterclass, which was hosted by the real estate institute, uh, REI, the real estate investor magazine, I beg your pardon. Um, and just yesterday, they sent me a report of the day. Um, and there was about 500 rental agents slash invest and, and all investors that um, were, were on the line at the time. And they did some poll questions, which I thought was rather interesting. And one of the questions was, what is the biggest reason rental agents lose mandates? Well, you lose mandates, I think was the actual question. And the poll results said the biggest reasons, and this I assume was mainly agents that would have asked, answered this because investors don't have mandates. Um, was firstly bad service, and this is the agents of about 500 people um, having the opportunity to answer this. Um, the first reason, or the most popular reason, or most unpopular reason, I suppose, when it comes to losing mandates, is bad service. And the second one has to do with vacancies. And I think the vacancies particularly is a sign of the current times that we are in. Um, and, but we'll get into that in a moment um, and we'll look at the latest stats or facts that are available. So that was interesting. And one of the advantages of a standard operating procedure is the fact of being able to deliver consistent service. But, uh, you know, just an ordinary standard operating procedure doesn't help for that. One really needs something with um, or an operating procedure that has associated communication templates, et cetera, which we'll be, we'll be touching on as we go through this. 
Another question that was asked in the poll on the particular day was, what is the most important success factor to help you grow your portfolio? And interestingly enough there, um, more than 60%, um, that's my estimate, I can't see the exact figure there, uh, more than 60% of the people, the attendees, said clear SOPs, followed very far behind by a growth structure, a clear value proposition, and then you can see the other answers. And then the last one we're just going to touch on. Uh, this is the sort of information that we that I add every time. Um, as I say, when I update it, sorry, I need to go back to the question. What is the biggest risk for not having clear standard operating procedures? And the agents that were there, um, the most the, the most important or the the big the, the, the biggest risk that came out of the group was struggling to grow and losing a mandate. And of course, mandates give us money. And the same way that vacant properties don't give us money, so we need to get them filled as well. So that's just some background to today's uh, presentation. And I think it just goes, and I thought that was interesting, because as I say, I only re re um, received that information yesterday. Um, I will share that report. Let me just make a note. Uh, share that report and the recording of that ultimate masterclass, by the way, will be available, I'm told, by the end of the week. So as soon as I get hold of that recording, I will be sharing it. So make sure, well, you don't need to make sure because you are registered and so you will be on my mailing list and you will know all about that. So let's focus back now on the lease renewal and the best practice guidelines that I have found over the years works very well. The very first one, is a sort of a no-brainer. There's two particular, particular pieces of legislation that, that, that govern this, this process, the lease renewal process. The first or the primary one there being the Consumer Protection Act. And then we get at the FICA legislation. As I say, that has to do with the, um, particularly the amended one, the most recent amendment. Um, so let's have a look at those before we get into the procedure. Um, Consumer Protection Act Section 14, and we are going to look at this as a bit, in a bit of detail um, because I think it's important to understand this because that's how every single step and the order of the steps of the process that I'm going to take you through makes sense. The Section 14 deals with the expiry and renewal of fixed term agreement. So there's the first clue, fixed term agreement. The majority of the leases, though, that we deal with would be a fixed term agreement. And if it's not a fixed term agreement, we wouldn't be renewing. So we are talking here when it comes to renewal of fixed term agreements. And it says that this section does not apply to transactions between juristic persons, regardless of their annual turnover or asset value. And this is where people start generally getting confused and saying this gets a little bit complicated. So let's see which uh, leases does the um, Section 14 of the Consumer Protection Act apply to. And to do that, I have a cheat sheet. Oopsie, let's see if I can just get it to come onto the right screen there. There we are. Um, I have created a cheat sheet. There we are, uh, which I will send you afterwards um, at the end of this webinar to help you or to, to help especially new people, but, but anybody who gets confused, because to be honest, I get confused. Uh, you know, when you're dealing with this and when you're preparing for a presentation like today, then I can probably tell it to you in my sleep tonight. Um, but when one is not dealing with this every single day, you do start to get a little bit confused. So let's look at the Consumer Protection Act as a whole uh, before we get to section 14. The Consumer Protection Act deals with natural person or juristic entity landlords, as well as natural person or juristic entity tenants under with a, a, they call it an asset value or a turnover of under 2 million rand per annum. Um, because the Consumer Protection Act does not apply to consumers, tenants or consumers um, who are juristic entities and have a turnover or an asset value of equal to or more than 2 million rand. So the combinations, the combos, it's like McDonald's here. Uh, the combos are natural, natural, juristic, the landlord, um, juristic, uh, any type of juristic, as long as the tenant is a natural person or juristic. Remember, it's called the Consumer Protection Act. So the focus here is on the consumer. 
However, when we do get to section 14, and this goes back to the, let me just see, yeah, the slide that I just spoke about a moment ago, where we said the section does not apply to transactions between juristic persons regardless. So between, in other words, both parties juristic. So let's go back to our cheat sheet and see what it says. I have to be careful when I say that word. Um, so we're looking at, remember, natural person and juristic entity landlord. However, if you take those two combinations, you say natural, 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 juristic, less than 2 million, juristic, natural, juristic, and juristic, less than 2 million, you have those four possibilities. But specifically excluded for section 14 is agreements between juristic entities, meaning both parties are juristic entities. So that is excluded. So you have three combinations. The landlord can be either a natural person or juristic entity. The tenant, as you will see here, is a natural person or a juristic entity less than 2 million, as long as the landlord is not. So I will, I will, I will share this cheat sheet, and it's something we will go through as we go through the procedure, and we will see how it's dealt with. So hopefully that does make sense to you guys. Um, unfortunately, they don't write the law easy. You know, they don't just say, well, this is it, and it, uh, this is how it works. So let's go back to section 14, expiry and renewal of fixed term agreements. This section does not apply. We've dealt with that. Then it goes on to say, if a consumer agreement is for a fixed term. So we are dealing here with consumer agreements, lease agreements in our particular case, that is, of a, that is a fixed term. As I said, that's sort of logical, um, but we forget sometimes when we think about these things that anything that's not a fixed term, in our particular case that we're looking at lease renewals, of course, you only release something when it comes to the end of a fixed, uh, renew something, release something, renew, some, uh, renew an agreement when it comes to the end of a fixed term. But when it comes to the other um, requirements of section 14, then it can get com complicated. But lease renewals, at least, is a little bit more simple there. So what does it say? It, say, it says, not more than 80, nor less than 40 business days. Business days. So we're talking two to four months before the expiry date of the fixed term of the consumer agreement, the supplier, the supplier, the landlord, or the landlord's uh, agent must notify the consumer in writing or any other recordable form of the impending expiry date. And this is important, not be, I mean, we're fortunate in that most tenants are not totally aware of all of these things. But part of my, my, my goal um, when I speak to people and when I help people with uh, operating procedures is to say, let's prepare for the worst and hope for the best. So we are going to do the right thing, and this is my goal, to do the right thing the first time. Because if you do have a tenant who is aware of this, and they figure out that you didn't send them a 40 to 80 business day notice that um, complies with all the requirements of the Act, you can end up being liable, being held liable by your landlords um, for not doing the right thing and costing them money in the case of, let's say, something like a rent increase needed to be implemented and we did not fulfill the requirements, as a person who puts ourselves out there and markets ourselves um, as a rental expert, we are expected to know these things and to ensure that we protect our landlord. And if we don't, and, it, and the landlord is financially negatively affected, we can be held liable. So that's why this is important. So we need to let them know of the impending expiry date and any material changes, and we're going to talk about these words, that would apply if the agreement is to be renewed or may otherwise continue beyond the expiry date, uh, in other words, month to month, and the options available to the consumer in terms of paragraph D, and we will get to paragraph D in a moment. So the supplier, the landlord, the landlord must notify the landlord or the landlord's agent, obviously, if that's included in our mandated agreement with the landlord. And so the landlord must notify the tenants. I'm just translating here to, to, to rental speak. Any material changes that would apply if the agreement is to be renewed. In other words, 
any material changes if you are making an offer of renewal. Or may otherwise continue. And that would normally be a month to month. I mean, you know, the two options are really, if it's going to continue, there's two options of, of continuing. The one is a fixed term continuation for a, pretty, for a period, which is an offer of renewal. The other one is convert to a month to month or, or, or move to a month to month. Either way, it says we must give a notice of any material changes. Now, what is a material change? Rent, in particular, is a material change. If there's anything else in terms of the lease agreement that's going to change that is of a material nature, in other words, it's something that somebody may wish to accept or not accept, it may influence their decision. That's the easiest way for me to explain material. But rent is the most important one. If there is going to be a change of the rent, whether we are going to renew for a fixed period or otherwise continue, in other words, month to month, we must give them a notice of any material changes which includes the rent. And then we also need to tell them of the options available to the consumer. Once again, consumer equals tenant. Then if we go to section D, remember that thing said about, uh, C, C talked about D, as they do in law. Um, the options available. So we need to tell them what the options are and any material changes that would apply. That's the simplest thing. On the expiry of the consumer agreement, the fixed term lease, um, so this is what we need to say, it will be, the lease will automatically continue on a month-to-month -month basis, but here's something that a lot of people don't understand. Subject to any material changes of which the supplier has been given notice. So even if it continues on a month-to-month -month basis, which is the default position in terms of Section 14, the material changes that can be implemented are those of which the supplier has been given notice. Um, and that would include any annual... Uh, this says increase, okay, but these days we might be talking decrease, and we'll get to this information in a moment. Um, the reality is any change of the rental amount is one of the critical ones. Of course, the period and all that sort of thing. Um, subject any of which they know. If we don't give notice, and particularly here, yeah, I think we a lot a lot of agents or agencies could be vulnerable in the case of a month to month because a lot of people, including landlords, etc., assume that the default position is go to a month to month, and we know that is the case because we've just looked at section C. I think it's. 14C, 14C, sorry, 14C of the Consumer Protection Act. However, the default position does say here, um, subject to any material changes, okay, it will automatically go to a month to month, subject to any material changes of which the supplier has been given notice. So, and the notice we're talking about here is the 40 to 80 business day. Um, somebody's sound is on, if you could please mute yourself, if you don't mind, um, of which the supplier has been given notice. So if we have not been given the supply, no, if they, we haven't given the supply notice, then we can't make it subject to any of these material changes. And that is important to remember because I think that there may be a vulnerability where often if there, it's going to go on to a month to month, we just implement whatever was in the previous agreement. But it's saying here that subject to and legal legal opinion on the legal opinion on this does vary, but I, I like to err on the side of caution. I do not want to be facing a landlord who says uh, a tenant takes us, let's say, to tribunal and says, "But you didn't give me a forty to eighty business day notice. How have you implemented this rent increase?" And we say, "No, well, you see, it's, it's in your agreement." And they say, "No, no, no," and they go to the tribunal and they say, "But they didn't give me." a notice of a material change, which was a rent increase or a rent change. Let's call it that way. Nobody's going to complain about a decrease, of course, um, which is a rent change. And then, the, the let's say, the tribunal rules that, yes, we didn't follow that process. And you know where the tribunal is sort of six of one, half a dozen of the other. Now, it's 50-50 chance whether you get a ruling that agrees with the lawyer that you deal with or not. So I would rather be cautious and make sure I want to tick that box as I move forward, because I do not want a landlord to say to me, but you did not... You, I'm now out of pocket because they rescinded that increase. You now have to do it again in the correct format, 40 to 80 business days. Remember, that's the notice. 
40 days is at least two months. I'm out of pocket by the month that we've just lost, the two months that it took us to go to tribunal, plus the two months you've got to give them. I want you to pay me that. It's not worth it. Then the, la the, 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 the mandate becomes a non-profitable uh, contract. And then it says, unless the consumer expressly directs the supplier to terminate the agreement, otherwise they give notice of termination, okay, or agrees to a renewal. So, if they do not give us notice or agree to a renewal, it is going to convert to a month-to-month, -month, but the, 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 you, they need to have been notified of those material changes. And where do you notify them? In the 40 to 80 business day letter. And that is the consumer. And of course, giving, uh, terminating the agreement is giving legal written notice in terms of whatever your terms and conditions are in the lease. And agrees to a renewal, ah, important point here, important point here. Agrees to a renewal, in my opinion, is signed, sealed, paid for, delivered. If it's not signed, sealed, paid for, delivered, then no, agree, no renewal has been agreed to. And this is, this, this is I, I know I've dealt with issues in this particular case. So somebody says, yes, I want to renew on that. And then you start doing things and doing things and time runs and time runs. And we're going to talk about the time periods I, I, I advise. Time runs and time runs. And what happens? All of a sudden you get to the end of the period. Nobody's answered, et cetera, et cetera. We're now going uh, into a, 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 because it's not agreed to, because it's not agreed to. Remember, most lease agreements say that. Any changes to this lease agreement need to be in writing and agreed to by both parties. So when a, a lease has been reduced to writing, the renewal has to be in writing. So this verbal thing doesn't, your lease agreement forbids any verbal changes. Um, okay, if you had emails backwards and forwards, you might, you might be okay. Um, but that, that needs to be uh, tested and checked on a case-by-case on a, on a, on a, you know, -case basis. So unless they agree to renewal, or they direct the supplier to terminate, it will go on to a month to month, but material changes only can be implemented if they have been notified. Lastly, um, and this is the thing, this is something I've actually just built into the checklist because it wasn't there. The minister may prescribe the maximum duration of a fixed term consumer agreement. And we know that the minister, whoever the minister was at the time, did prescribe that a consumer agreement, lease agreement, may be a maximum of 24 months unless we can show a demonstrable financial benefit to the consumer or the tenant. Why is this important? Why the hell am I even bringing this up? Because um, some of the lawyers warn about this, that if you have a, let, let's say we're starting with a brand new lease agreement and you then do a renewal addendum a renewal addendum does not create a new lease. A renewal addendum extends the current lease. So if you have a, an agreement of 12 months and you then just do an addendum to renew that lease, then you've reached the maximum permitted duration of a fixed term agreement. So when you then come to the end of the second year, you Arguably, and uh, the legal legal opinion, once again, legal opinion is always different. Yeah. Um, but legal opinion, or some legal opinion says, if you then just do an addendum, you are then in breach of the maximum duration for a fixed term period. Now, I could argue that either way. Bottom line is, it's not about how I argue it. It's about, do you want to take the risk of ending up at a tribunal? Now, I don't know any tenants that have done this. Um, I've never been involved in it where they say, oh, but our agreement's for longer than two years. Um, but be careful of that. Once again, do the right thing the first time so that you know you are protected and 